Welcome to the Black Sparrow Media Internet Broadcast Network. Listening to Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a podcast about Linux, open source, and amateur radio for everyone. Now, here are your hosts Russ, K5GUX, Cheryl, W5MOO, and Bill, NE4RD. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 522 of Linux in the Hamshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. And this is the long, long awaited deep dive episode that we're finally going to get into. And what we're going to talk about tonight is a distribution, a specific distribution, one that's newly rolled out and has a ton of different variants. And we're going to get into all of that. But before we do, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. Cheryl W5MOO is on assignment, I think, for the last time. We um, are supposed to have our move everything back into the house party, if you will, on next Saturday. And if that actually happens the way it's supposed to, she will have her set up all back together Saturday night and she'll be available for next Sunday's recording. So yeah, it's been a long time coming. That's for sure. Anyway, so she's not here, but hopefully next time I'm Russ K5TUX. And I'm Bill NE4RD. All right. So Bill, I'm going to let you kick this off because you set the topic, and then based on setting the topic, I did a lot of exploration today, so I should have some things to interject, but you have been using Fedora 39 for at least a little while, and uh, in a production environment, so I guess uh, we'll let you open up the topic, and then we'll dive into it. Absolutely. So yeah, this topic is Fedora 39, and this is our deep dive. We have, uh, yeah, a new release of Fedora. My, my, my server is not running Fedora 39 yet, so it is still running Fedora 38. And that has been the only Fedora box in my house for a while, I guess. Uh, maybe I have a Fedora 38 desktop I used at Hamvention for the K2BSA booth. Hey, look, I even mentioned K2BSA in this podcast. It works out great. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, it's very good. It, uh, it, it was just released. Uh, I haven't seen too many complaints about it. So this gave me an opportunity to a make a nice deep dive topic for our podcast and also uh, experiment with, you know, maybe distro hopping here on the ham shack computer. You know how much I, I really enjoy doing this. So we're going to go through first and look at all of the fancy, propaganda from uh, the Get Fedora page that I cut and pasted onto our show notes. So we can talk about a little bit about uh, Fedora Workstation 39. And uh, they have on their website, why, why Fedora, thir- uh, why Fedora Workstation? Why would you want this? Well, they say each version is updated for approximately 13 months and upgrades between versions are quick and easy. From experience, that is very true. However, uh, if you're used to, well, if you're not used to Fedora updates, they like to do a lot of updates in a reboot. So it's very reminiscent of a Windows update. So some people will not appreciate that as much. However, I I do appreciate the fact that it's, it's a very stable system. Uh, with Fedora, your desktop is your own. It's free and there are no ads and your data belongs to you. Somehow I feel this comment is a stab at canonical... <laughs> <laughs> putting in various ads. well also uh what windows with their uh you know you you want edge why are you using uh chrome you should download edge uh workstation is carefully curated to deliver a high quality experience the desktop is clean and uncluttered agree uh desktop uh, development in partnership with upstream projects rigor, rigor, rigorously tested backed by red hat and slash IBM uh, built on the latest technologies and enhancements that are open that open source has to offer. 
Uh, Fedora works with hardware vendors to make excellent hardware support across a range of devices. Uh, we know this from uh, the Lenovo Fedora laptops that you can get. Uh, Fedora comes with a fantastic collection of applications, which cater to every need. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but uh, easily install the very best desktop apps with a click of a button from Fedora repositories, FlatHub, or anywhere else. Does that include Snap? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, thanks to a global community of translators, Workstation is available in many languages. Flip a switch and turn on dark mode and give your eyes a break or use nightlight to reduce screen glare and help with sleep. Uh, just getting off the computer will help with sleep, I think. Uh, optionally, bring your online calendar contacts and data to the desktop with online account syncing or online accounts. Uh, which also includes some syncing. Uh, Fedora Workstation includes a great set of utilities like clocks, weather, and maps. Uh, Boxes takes the guesswork out of using virtual machines. Uh, Just select the OS you want to install, and the app will do the rest. Yes, I think we've talked about GNOME boxes for... uh, yeah, quite some time. That's that's pretty good. Uh, use performance mode to boost hardware when s- hardware speed when you need it. Uh, turn off notifications with Do Not Disturb. Press Super Key and just type Search for what you need. Uh, yeah, oh, we'll get back to that. Uh, use the latest container tools from Red Hat ecosystem. No startup required. Access the Red Hat Container Registry. I have not, not tested this, so I can't talk about this at all. And all the packages, tools, and runtimes you might need up to date and ready to use with just a single command. Yes. Yes. Uh, so initial impressions. Uh, we'll, we'll start with the three. So I've, I kind of tested three different editions, and I'm interested to see what Rust tested. I chose for my additions to kind of run through the gamut of things. Uh, Fedora Workstation 39, the default, comes with GNOME. And yeah, what can I say? It's a it's a generic GNOME experience. Uh, I also tried the Fedora Budgie spin because yeah, you know, Budgie, it's a it's a it's an old friend of mine, especially when I wanted to use Solus and uh, I had no soul apparently. And uh, that's what I used. Uh, and then also Fedora Onyx, which is the immutable desktop experience with Budgie. So I have also tried that, and I'm actually still running Fedora Onyx in a production setting at uh, at uh, the theater, uh, running sound, running a soundboard for a show that is uh, still in production. We're doing three more showings. So, uh, yeah, it uh, it runs, and it uh, it runs actually quite well. And I know I put a lot of screenshots, uh, well, not a lot, probably a few screenshots and pictures in the uh, chat room over the past uh, couple of weeks uh, during testing. And some people noticed that I was running Linux show player on it. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely do a probably a topic later on on that particular application just because A, it's cool. B, it's 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 cool. And C, it's open source. So, uh, yeah, very cool stuff. Um, so which additions did you try, Russ? Well, I took a cue from you, and I tried Workstation 39, the Budgie Spin, and Onyx Budgie. Oh, wow. You did exactly the same ones. (laughs) Now, I will say that I also tried the Sway version because I'm interested in tiling window managers now. So uh, I did try that one. I did not get super far with that, but I did do the other three that you did. Oh, okay. Well, I'm kind of interested to hear about Sway because I know you had mentioned uh, something about uh, you know possibly going to uh, sw- Sway in your next uh, next deployment uh, of a desktop. So uh, definitely want to hear about that. Uh, but let's uh, let's just talk about the generics of it. Um, I don't even I'm trying to I don't even have the right computer here to to look at the the kernel version. It's a six dot x kernel, right? You do you have one up on you right now? I don't have one accessible to me. Yeah. No, it's on the computer next to me. So I did not. We're so bad. It, it is six two. I think six two. Yeah, that's, that sounds that sounds right. <laughs> if I remember right from seeing it boot up and doing an update on the regular workstation version, I think it was six two something. Yes. Yeah, my physical hardware is is physically down at the theater because I don't I don't unplug anything. I don't change any mixer settings. <laughs> I just lock the computer and walk away. So when I come back and turn on the show, I don't have to adjust any levels and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a good experience. Uh, the installer is the standard installer that's been with Fedora for probably the last, I don't know, six or seven revisions. So if you've done a Fedora 30-something installation, 
yeah, your your installer is going to be basically the same. Uh, nothing spectacular out of that was uh, surprising. I did notice that by default, it did have some of the RPM Fusion uh, uh, connections for the um, for the repository manager uh, connected already. I don't know if you noticed that as well. At least for the drivers. So to handle the the NVIDIA drivers and the AMD proprietary drivers, should there be one that you want to turn on for AMD. But uh, specifically for the uh, NVIDIA drivers, I did see that that was added. Uh, did you have to add any more connections to the RPM Fusion libraries for yourself? That did not come up in my install. I I have uh, a – what the heck is a video card in my machine? It's, it's like the RTX. Um, RTX? Wow. Fancy. <laughs> yeah. So uh no, I, that it did not address that. And I was I was running all of my stuff under uh VMware workstation. So Oh, okay. Yeah, so it was it was fairly new to me to to see those actually connected. If you enabled third party repositories, those are the ones that actually were connected. So you could see those. Uh you do get that uh, prompt at uh at initial installation time. So you'll you'll get prompted if you want to enable those. I highly recommend it. Otherwise, you'll have to come back later and add them. Uh, through those repositories, you can get additional amateur radio software uh, when you want to add it. Something like, I don't know, CQR log or K log or uh, one of the many other loggers that isn't, isn't held within the standard Fedora um, repository. So you'll need the RPM Fusion. And I think we've talked about the RPM Fusion connections multiple times that like that's a needed a needed addition to your, <laughs> to your fedora installation uh the only thing that differs when you get to the immutable desktop of course is the fact that it only installs well basically flat packs yeah there are there are some other options but yeah everything i installed using onyx was via flat pack yeah, so you, what you have available is quite limited, and I did I did pose down in the notes um, only because it's sort of <laughs> sort of when we talk about ham radio ready, could you actually use an immutable desktop for amateur radio in the case of using Fedora thirty nine uh, Onyx edition? And I I have to say that yeah, you probably could do it. Um, there are there is logging, there is rig control. Uh, so there was Xlog just if just straight out of the box, like you could use Xlog, you can use rig control. So FL rig was in there, Hamlib was in there, um, FL Digi was available, uh, WSJTX is available, uh, JTDX, is that right? Yeah, JTDX, the basically slightly altered version of WSJTX is also available via Flatpak. And uh, which also kind of gave me a little experience in actually loading that up and and visually going through the uh, UI inside of JTDX, which I really hadn't messed with in a in a while. And uh, then I started to notice that there's like there's a W no there's JTWX or no JT JTDX sorry <laughs> I'm getting all these stupid acronyms or whatever JTDX and there's also JTDX improved. So there's two versions of that uh, that are out in the wild, although JTDX is the only one available via Flatpak. Uh, WSJTX, uh, you know, you know, is the standard one that comes from Joe Taylor and, and the team over there. But there's also a WSJTX improved version. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely some future uh, topics coming towards you on looking at uh, those improved versions and what they actually are doing. Uh, to the actual release versions. Um, but, uh, you know, I kind of ran across those in the whole kind of exploring the, you know, the ability to use this Fedora Onyx. Uh, the first thing I think you'll notice that with the immutable desktop is there is no uh, DNF. <laughs> it's the first thing I went to is, uh, yeah, so you do DNF uh, <laughs> install something or search something. And there was like, yeah, that command doesn't exist in this in this version so uh, uh, yeah, there's a, a definite learning curve. Did you did you kind of run into that too when you <laughs> used Onyx? I did. The very first thing I did was try to install something via DNF, and of course it failed miserably. But I went immediately back to the GUI software manager and was able to install stuff that way. And of course, you can use the Flatpak commands to install stuff out of the Flatpak repos. And uh, I, I installed a few other things just to test and see kind of what was around in Flatpak form. 
Mm -hmm. I did uh, Zaster, which is in there. I did SDR Angel, which is in there. I did oh, Cubic yeah. SDR, GQRX. Those are all in there. And um, I talked with Tag today in Zero TTL about Grid Tracker, and they are working on a flat pack for Grid Tracker. So mm. that will soon be available. Yeah. So uh, I think it's it's a possible maybe on whether you could actually use this for amateur radio. Uh, so the mutable desktop, which we've talked about a little bit in the past, so you can kind of put it into your mind. It operates much like a cell phone does, where the cell phone has an image for the operating system and all the apps are sort of compartmentalized and sideloaded. Um, in this case, we have Flatpak or Flat Hub, which is still Flatpak, right? <laughs> <laughs> the repo for flat packs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like similar to a snap or an app image, or much like your cell phone applications. You know, it's the same kind of same kind of deal. Uh so your operating system can continually change underneath of it, and supposedly the flat packs will just continue to operate within the confines of the excess access that they, that they need against the kernel and everything else to do whatever they do for your applications. Uh, in theory, this works really well because your 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 operating system can never be contaminated from the user space or from the applications, but it also limits your availability to applications because they must be within the confines of whatever packaging system is currently compartmentalizing the application. In this case, flat packs. Um, again, I don't I don't test any app images, but I would assume the app images would work. And I didn't try any snaps, but I would assume you could probably install Snap D on there. That probably comes in Flatpak. Um, I did a I did a Flatpak of install of Snap or something that I, I I just typed Snap and I installed something, but I don't know if it was the actual Snap manager. <laughs> so, well, yeah, Snap Snap D is the only thing that's that you need to install to get Snaps to work. So. Um, but yeah, so anyway, if we'll come back to that topic at, at some time in the future as people give us comments on how incoherent this was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very, very. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, send your comments to Russ at... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so you know, it was interesting. I I, I really uh, I kind of took a stab at it just to see and see like, oh, I could survive in this. This is not bad, you know. Because I sit there and I I was uh, I was looking at uh, you know Facebook because yeah, I have nothing better to do while I'm in the middle of a show waiting for the next queue to fire. And uh, you know, I was seeing these people put pictures of their shacks, you know, their ham radio shacks, <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, look at this fancy, you know. Um, flex radio 6700 and the this the picture that they take of their shack has nothing but you know wsjtx running <laughs> and i'm like eh, you don't need anything special for that you know <laughs> just put up a you know immutable desktop with some uh, wsjtx and uh, you're off to the races but uh yeah for the others you know what did you think about budgie i mean coming because we looked at budgie before and i think we even had it on one of our releases even though i think the installer was semi busted for some people just due to hardware. But uh, what did you think about coming back and looking at uh, Budgie as a as a desktop environment? I seem to remember Budgie on whatever desktop, or I guess it was on Solus and maybe something else. Ubuntu. Uh, oh yeah, Ubuntu uh, Budgie. That's right. I remember it being sexier, and um, it when I installed the Fedora version of it, it looked boring to me. <laughs> it almost it it kind of felt like LXDE. <laughs> And, it seemed uh, very flat, right? Yeah. It, it seemed very, very dull and lifeless. And I was I was actually more impressed by the GNOME 40 or 42 or whatever the current version of GNOME is on the standard works, workstation environment. And, you know, it uh, it was the same on Onyx, of course, because it uses Budgie as well. So yeah. I was I was not impressed by that. I did I did kind of tinker around more with Onyx because it was the the sort of different paradigm and trying to get used to OS tree based operating systems, atomic operating systems, and, uh, you know, that new, that new paradigm and trying to navigate around and work with, you know, flat packs primarily, which, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's not that difficult. It's just, it's just a slight mind shift. And 
you know, for me, I can sort of see immutable operating systems being really, really helpful in a server environment. But for a workstation, I'm not sure I see the benefit. Probably not for like an individual user. I mean, if you're deploying it to multiple users, more of like an enterprise environment, I see a lot of viability in that particular aspect. But at least for myself as a user, I would say fine. Maybe if I was doing this for my my father, who is in his 80s, yeah, I'd probably give him an immutable desktop. (laughs) That way he can't break anything. Um, so, I mean, I think there are some use cases for sure, even for like a daily driver use, like, you know, people that should probably have a Chromebook, uh, this would be a good, good kind of baseline OS for. Yeah. If you're setting up something for somebody else, who's not particularly savvy, I suppose, and you just want to have a desktop that fires up, you know, has a, a static set of applications and does one thing and can pretty much not be corrupted by, you know, wandering fingers or, or crazy, you know, mouse clicks, then yes, absolutely. I see exactly where you're coming from. Yeah. But yeah, budgie. Boy, oh boy. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit flat looking. However, I did I did take my budgie install and uh I uh I added uh I added the sweet theme to it and then I added the candy icons to it. So it sort of looks like uh so it sort of looks like uh Garuda Linux. <laughs> Sort of, sort of looks like Budgie should, in other words. Yeah, it was still kind of flat looking. I think, uh, I think like they've taken some of the shine off of the uh, off of the theme because it used to be a little bit more three D looking and maybe a little bit more like semi transparent, glossy semi transparent, like the default theme. Uh, maybe this is their way some, to cut. Kind of, yeah, I did notice some random transparency and stuff in. Uh, like menu overlays and stuff like that. So some of that was still there, but it was very, it was almost muted, like subtleized. Yeah. Someone nerfed it all. I think that's, what, <laughs> <laughs> that's the indication I got from the experience. So I, yeah, I wasn't, I had already downloaded four ISOs. So I was, I was seriously considering downloading the plasma version just to see if they had sort of gone the same way with it. Uh, but, but after downloading, you know, 25 gigs worth of uh, fedora. I was like, okay, I'm kind of done with this. So. Yeah, you got to take a break somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I think uh, at Fedora 39 in general is uh, you'll have a great experience if you want to do ham radio readiness with it. I don't have a score ready, but I will be, uh, I will be producing a, a little, you know, getting your Fedora Workstation 39 ham radio ready video on youtube hopefully so nobody can complain about my whatever fedora version 34 or something like that that's (laughs) that's actually there (laughs) so we'll get that updated uh and i hope uh i hope to to kind of go over it in a a, a, a quite a bit more detail uh during the installation including going through and you know importing a log into CQR log, log and going through the the gobbledygook of getting everything actually connected including rig control like I normally do and I do this on real hardware <laughs> in the in the demo uh it might not necessarily be the radio I'm currently using but uh uh because I have multiple radios and multiple interfaces I can definitely plug into a real radio and uh trigger everything that needs to be triggered for testing but I think it's it's quite capable, including the I was I was literally uh, going through my Garuda system here and backing up my home directory, thinking, yeah, I think I'm gonna wipe my uh, my precision and get Garuda off there and put Fedora 39 on there, um, mainly because I noticed that the Wi-Fi works flawlessly. <laughs> I don't know if it's just the specific version that I have running on specific version of the kernel that I have running on my uh, precision, but my precision does not like using the Wi-Fi card inside of Garuda. And I'm running the, uh, I believe I'm running the Xan mod kernel on it right now, which runs the best for performance wise. But the trade-off is my, my Wi-Fi card doesn't work. So I plug into Ethernet, but the way I have my current network set up, Ethernet is pretty much not going to give me much advantage down here in the basement because I have a mesh network and the mesh points are connected wirelessly between downstairs and upstairs. 
So even if I went and wired into the access point, it wouldn't give me anything faster than what the intermediate connection between the two access points can get to each other. So, and since it's right here in the garage, there's no sense of me plugging in a cable in because Wi-Fi is, you know, hundred percent all bars, everything else. And I've seen some weirdness. I don't know if you've noticed this, at least with, you know, residential access points and stuff like that. Maybe Ubiquity doesn't quite have this problem, but I've noticed that there's some disparity between what it provides via Wi-Fi and what it provides via Ethernet on the same AP, even in a mesh network. Like the the Ethernet is almost degraded against the Wi-Fi data. I know it's not within our, the scope of our topic, but <laughs> I just... I just, I just Notice that particular issue of mine, but I'm I'm just using the crappy AP provided by the modem that I get from my SP. So, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So it it might just be my perception <laughs> of stuff, but like I've noticed this uh, when every time I you know change out the system, which I do change out the network in here in the house quite often because uh, I like to try out different things and stuff like that, and things I don't like I you know give away or donate to organizations like, oh yeah, here's a great Wi-Fi adapter for your building. Here you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, the current one is, uh, yeah, I noticed that the Wi-Fi is, is way faster than the ethernet side of things. So that's, that's maybe that's just me. I don't know. could be perception, but I mean, uh, I've run some like iperf tests through here on the, on the wired network and everything Settles out pretty pretty close to the gigabit speed. It usually runs around 900 meg out of iperf, and I I know my Wi-Fi is slower than that. So, <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, if you're not running like the latest Wi-Fi seven or whatever, it's, you know, where you can get gigabit speeds via Wi-Fi, yeah, which I'm not. Yeah. So. <laughs> so. Anyway, back to topic. Fedora, it's great. It's uh, the latest sexy version. Uh, go to getfedora.org. I believe that's right. Or get Fedora. Is that right? Get Fedora. I don't even remember. I just Googled it and it, you know, clicked on the Fedora button. <laughs> so yeah, I always do the get Fedora. Yeah. Get Fedora.org. How about that? Yeah. Get Fedora.org is, uh, well, it goes to Fedora project anyway. <laughs> so let me yeah. give a quick shout out to, um, obviously this is off topic as well, but I want, I want to mention it again, just because for me and my environment, it's so cool. So now when I download an ISO, regardless of what the ISO is, whether it's Windows or Linux. Are you going to talk about iVentoy again? <laughs> I, I am. I, I, throw, I, just take the, I just take the ISO and I throw it into iVentoy, and then I can just boot it on anything I have here. I don't have to worry about USB sticks. I don't, you know, I don't have to worry. <laughs> well, it, that's booting anything that's on Ethernet, right? Any, anything that's connected to the network somehow that can, that can use Pixie, yes, obviously. But, well, Pixie I mean, only it, works via Ethernet, right? Yes, adapters that support Pixie, generally oh, speaking. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Wi-Fi support Pixie at all? I don't know. I don't probably not. I've never used it that way, so probably not. Yeah. But, but like, all of my VMs, all of my VM servers are connected, you know, hardline. So if I want to spin up a, a VM of anything, it's available on iVentoy. So. Right. And iVentoy is the actual non-open source version of Ventoy, right? No, it's open source. It's just the Pixie boot version. It, Ventoy is the one that writes stuff to USB sticks. iVentoy is the one that uses is network connected. Right, and the uh, the iVentoy is the non open source one. I thought I thought it was open source. They had they have like a commercial version and a free version. Oh, I was I was I, under the impression that the Pixie boot version was technically proprietary, but it like still freeware kind of thing unless you were in an enterprise environment. Well, I know it's like a, it has a you can pay for it model that gives you some adv advanced features, which up till now I've not needed because it just sort of works. And uh, apparently, I've been to a, the free version. I, I guess I I will you know plead ignorance to the to the licensing. Um, I just like the software, so I'm going to use it. <laughs> but um, it it also does. Uh, UFI and BIOS booting via Pixie. So any kind of system, if you can, if you can get to the network, it will work with, which is really cool. So, but again, wandered away from Fedora 39. So, uh, Fedora 39, by the way, the, the other versions are all just like any other Fedora version you've ever seen. The only one that was sort of interesting to me is the one we've been talking about, which is the immutable one. There's also another immutable one called Silver Blue. I don't remember what the differences are. Um, so yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. 
I don't know why you chose Onyx for the one that you're using at the theater, oh. but because uh, it's it's Budgie, that's why. That's, oh, that's because the Budgie, right. but but they ruined Budgie. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I didn't know that before purchasing, so you know, it was kind of like a buyer's remorse. But you know, it works fine for the environment I have it in. Silver Blue has GNOME on it, so. <laughs> <laughs> And I think what are the other ones? Like they have the K version, which has uh, obviously KDE, and then there's a Sway version called uh, Seric, Seric, Seracia, Seracia, yeah, Seracia. That's so, true. So I tried the Sway version, um, and I found out that Sway is prob. Well, I mean, it probably will eventually be what I'm looking for. Um, That's tiling, right? Right, it's supposed to be like a rewrite and update of the i3 window manager. Okay, yeah. And I will say that i3 is poorly named because you're overloading on top of the Intel chipset. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really interested in tiling window managers because I'm trying to I'm trying to get into environments window managers that sort of eliminate the mouse factor, so I can control everything with keyboard. Mm. And that's what i3 and Sway do. Uh, The difference between the two, as I understand it, is that i3 is will sort of run on anything as far as your X system, but Sway is supposed to be a Wayland specific. That's what the W A Y. Oh, okay. In Sway is it's it combines the the window manager and the compositor together, and they're supposed to operate seamlessly under Wayland. That's the and what, how'd that work out for you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it worked fine. The, the biggest problem is I don't know anything about i3. Mm. And so I was busy watching YouTube videos on how to use it. And it looks really cool. And it does sort of exactly what I'm looking at. Obviously, it removes any kind of uh, prettiness and eye candy. It's, it all goes away because it's literally just Windows. Um, you, can do, you can do some eye candy. You can do some desktop, you know, backgrounds and uh, borders and and things like that. But it's sort of designed to be just functional using like super keys and you never have to touch a mouse, uh, including multi multi desktop and multi workspace environments, uh, multi monitors and all that stuff. And, And it's all handleable via keyboard. So, I mean, technically, even GNOME is handleable via keyboard. Not not easily, though. I mean, tabbing around and using like Alt Tab and Super Key for some functions, like and bringing up like your. But your, you can uh, you can part, script uh, all that. You can actually attach key binds to everything. And actually, right. there are some key binds that are there that most people have never actually used. Yes, I agree. But the whole point of i3 and, and uh, tiling window managers is that that stuff's already in there, and that's the main functionality, not a, a side. Well, that's the only way you can use it, right? You, right. Can you use a mouse, too? So you or, can yeah. use the mouse. Okay. But, but basically, it's <laughs> it's kind of like, at least what I got from the YouTube videos I was watching, that if you're using the mouse, you're basically doing it wrong and knock it off. So, <laughs> so uh, that was pretty funny. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. I do have to say because, like, uh, my my uh, the computer I'm using with the uh, with the Onyx and the Linux Show Player actually has a touch screen on it. So, like, the screen is touch sensitive and everything else, and that's exactly how I've been using it, except for when I'm doing edits and stuff like that. And the only the only issue I've noticed with that with I mean, if you have a laptop that has a touch screen, or you actually have a a PC with a touch screen, which would be even weirder. Uh, but they do exist. Is uh, is the delay between the OS wanting to switch between the two devices? Um, so it's like I can start moving the mouse after I've touched the screen, and the mouse doesn't appear for a little while until it decides that oh, you're moving the mouse. I might want to switch to this interface and show you the cursor once again. So that that was the only weird thing that I noticed with the, the like touch screen. Reminiscent of the thirty year old uh, serial port IRQ bug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah kind of, sort of. Yeah, that's very a uh, very reminiscent uh, version of the same problem. You know, I've noticed. Uh, so, like, I use KDE on 
on my other my XPS 13, uh, which is my crummy laptop, which has other kinds of problems, like including probably <laughs> the motherboard needs to be replaced. But that's besides the point. Uh, so I use KDE on there. It has a touch screen as well because it's an XPS 13 convertible flippy around device. And uh, that's pretty seamless. It switches between the keyboard or the, the mouse control and the, the screen control nearly instantly. I would I would feel that that's like the absolute best experience with that switchover. Um, and, and inside of Onyx with Budgie, with this particular flipping back and forth, I mean, this is a very specific use case. I, I don't know many people that would actually go back and forth um, unless they're used to doing that. Uh, it, it, it's definitely a weird experience uh, going back and forth just because of the delay. And since I've been using that Linux show player, I've been, you know, to, to, to edit a queue, you have to right click and then, you know, you know, the, the right clicky on the screen doesn't kind of like that functionality doesn't seem to work flawlessly where you would think like, oh, it's, a, it's you know, two, two finger press, you get the, uh, the right click menu. So like that doesn't work kind of as seamlessly. And I'm not sure if that's a function of uh, uh, the budgie OS or, or the budgie uh, desktop environment. Um, I will probably test some other ones on there just to kind of get that feel for it. But uh, if you're using that kind of interface, a touchscreen interface and a mouse, and you're planning on flipping back and forth, I wouldn't recommend uh, using that at all just because it, it is a bit, um, it's a bit weird. It's a bit weird. It's too much of a delay, too much of a delay between switching back and forth um, where the KDE on Garuda Linux is nearly instantaneous. Uh, You can flip back and forth all day long. Um, I haven't tried a virtual keyboard or anything else like that on the the touchscreen interface, but only because I I don't need it because I have a keyboard. So um, I wouldn't know what a tablet experience would work like uh, within that environment. But if it was touchscreen and it was always touchscreen, you know, maybe it'd work fine. Um, but that's it. That's about the only weird, weird aspect I can point out with that. Other than that, everything else worked just the same as Budgie's always worked, except for it was less pretty, like you said. Yeah, I just I just remember Budgie being really cool, especially the Ubuntu Budgie version, which was the one I used most of. And now I'm now I'm kind of like. Um, getting used to my other machine that I have outside for the, for one, I'm uh, doing stuff out in the garage, but I have it running uh, the Bodhi Linux with enlightenment. And I'm, I got to tell oh, you, yeah. really, really digging enlightenment. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a generally flat experience too, right? That's kind of like a oh, Monte no, no, or it something. Looks much glossier. It's well, the, uh, yeah, the themes and stuff like that, but you can fix that. Like, you can use all the GTK themes inside of Budgie to make it as sexy or less sexy than you want. Right. Absolutely. I mean, any anything can be tweaked. You know, it's just yeah, the out of box. I think I'm always is. looking at the out of box experience. Like, what does it look like just by firing it up? And you know, so you know, KDE and Plasma may not be the greatest desktop environment ever, especially because it's very heavyweight and there's lots of compositors and stuff in there and everything. But the way it looks is just like, Oh yeah. It's like, it almost causes you to drool because it's so pretty, <laughs> but you know, you but, gotta, but you does gotta, it have wiggly windows? That's what you need, right? <laughs> well, you can add those. <laughs> <laughs> like you say, it can all be fixed. Yes. Everything can be fixed. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Bottom line is, yeah, it's a totally capable system. Uh, there's a Fedora version for your workstation, for your server, uh, IOT. There's uh, that as well. You can run it on a single board computer. So there are uh, ARM builds for uh, Fedora. There's a cloud build, should you want it for a cloud environment. And there's also the core OS version, which is the container optimized version. So should you be using some sort of, you know, Docker container and a Kubernetes cloud or AWS or Azure or whatever, there is Fedora Core OS uh, that is updated. So, yeah, try, check it out. Try it out. Um, we'll uh, definitely probably add more content uh, with regards to this particular version of Fedora, uh, like I said, on the uh, YouTube site. And... Yeah, who knows? Maybe another deep dive into uh, the latest LTS. I don't think we've covered the latest LTS for uh, Ubuntu next time. We'll have, to, we'll have to see, or maybe we'll just do all Bodhi all the time, right? 
<laughs> Not necessarily because I like to keep my options open, but I do on that particular machine, since it's a little bit underpowered and doesn't have all of the great rendering capabilities or the super fast video card and stuff like that. But I still want something to look a little bit on the sexy side. I mean, it's really hard to beat. That yeah, uh, with a I, I think maybe we should talk about Bodhi next time. I think that'd be a good topic just to kind of, because it's a totally different desktop windowing environment. And, you know, maybe look at the nuances with applications that, you know, maybe aren't specifically designed for it, like K-Log that obviously was designed for KDE, you know, cute applications and stuff like that. It would be kind of cool to kind of look at those applications inside of a totally uh, foreign uh, windowing environment that uh, isn't specifically GTK or uh, cute. Yeah, that's actually, that would actually be kind of interesting. I I don't really run that stuff out there because it's not my Shack computer, so I'm not uh, hitting all the different um, windowing um libraries you know like the Qt and the, and all that stuff but um uh, now now i'm just gonna have to install it on something else and, and play around with it so see what it looks like i will say you mentioned a um a networking problem you were having with garuda earlier yeah and when i had garuda on that machine i was also having a problem it did not handle the open vpn connector well i could not get the uh my tunnels to, to come up using the uh gui tools so mm. so Garuda has some, apparently some um, pretty, um, well, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but uh, there, there are apparently several issues with networking, at least as far as uh, certain element of flakiness that yeah. comes along with Arch. Apparently so. <laughs> yeah. Because I did the same thing in, in uh, Bodhi, and it's just like, <laughs> click, click, boom, done. <laughs> yeah, I think there's some advantages to locking in specific you know, lines of the kernel that, that are sort of protect you from the ickiness that there is with uh, uh, running more of a <laughs> edge-based kernels and stuff like that. I mean, I have one, two, three, four systems uh, running Garuda Arch. One, well, two identical systems, and they both are, com they both act completely different. Uh, one has some really random issues. <laughs> Uh, and the other one does not. Uh, although both of them, I've had to turn off the uh, file indexing uh, from KDE just because Plasma and the whatever the Baloo uh, file indexer. Uh, if you actually have any magnetic drives, you will definitely be right with me and turning that off because you will hear it th hash and thrash your drive until yeah the magnets wear out. <laughs> Uh, same thing with uh, um, GNOME. GNOME has the like a really badly named one. I can't even remember what the GNOME name version of the same tool is that does all the file indexing. But it sounds like a crypto miner or something like that. Like that's how bad the name is. Um, I'm sure somebody will somebody will mention it. <laughs> but yeah, there's basically they have the same kind of file indexing utility that runs so that when you hit the super key and you start typing, it'll actually find files within your file system and everything else, you know, kind of a la Windows 10, Windows 11, start menu, search options kind of thing where it says, oh, look, I found this app. I found this website. I found this, you know, you know, when I hit the start key, I only want to know my apps. I don't really care about stuff on my file system. But I want stuff on my file system. I will look in the file explorer for it. But apparently uh, this came from the people that only know how to use Macs, right? Because that's a finder thing, sort of like the super finder. <laughs> Right. behavior where it's like oh yeah you just type something in we'll just give you everything that could possibly match what you're actually typing in uh, except for i don't think finder includes websites windows does the same thing you put that up you know you hit your star key and you start typing something it'll show you two applications yeah. uh 36 different libraries 17 websites uh um, yeah. you know the microsoft store version of the thing that you're looking for <laughs> the bing search results <laughs> yes. yes it's so bad it's so yeah. bad just please, everybody, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Not what I want to see when I hit the start menu. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so uh, Budgie doesn't have that. So that, that that is a nice part about that. Uh, literally, you hit the start menu, you only see the menu. Imagine that. I think that's the same in Amate and XFCE as well. So, But, again, those are not as fancy UIs as, as Fedora and KDE or Plasma, whatever you want to call it, are. Yep. Absolutely. But, uh, All right. Well, that's but yeah, that, I think that's seventeenth digression for this topic. So. <laughs> I think we can stop before we <laughs> get any worse. <laughs> All right. Do you want to wrap up Fedora thirty nine, or have we we pretty much put a pin in it? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's good. Yeah, I think it's worth trying. It uh, it was just released uh, the last couple weeks here, so give Fedora 39 a spin in your VM or on uh, some hardware. I'm getting ready to switch the Shack booter over to uh to a version just because I feel like it. Uh and uh yeah, I think I think you'll be happy. It, it it's definitely uh it's refined. Uh all the audio stuff appears to be fully functional. You know, a la the pipe wire incident of Fedora 36. We won't mention that. Uh, <laughs> they had a bad transition from Fedora uh, pipe wire to plumber, wire plumber, right? Is that what it is? Um, anyway, yeah, Fedora 39, get Fedora, try it out, check it out. It's pretty cool. I uh, actually concur, and I tried all the same versions that you did, so... <laughs> Uh, I, I liked it quite a bit. I would, it, you know, it would be a sort of a mind shift for me to go back into the DNF world from the apt world, but uh, I could certainly see it happening for sure. You could, you could just uh, LN tack S that and then be done. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, sort of, although the syntax is uh, marginally different. So, I mean, you could right. just do, you know, apt install <laughs> as well, long as you don't use like the new uh, regex stuff. <laughs> you'd be fine. <laughs> All right. Anyway, yeah, give Fedora thirty nine a try. It is pretty good. Although, uh, just don't don't expect to be blown away by the budgie version because uh, you won't be. <laughs> just don't tell Josh Strobel that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Darren says he might have a look right in the middle of nuke and pave after SQLite issues. Well, I guess if you're going to nuke and pave, you know, yeah. <laughs> here's your opportunity. So moving on from our main topic, we have some announcements and feedback, and we actually have some announcements. No feedback. I didn't, I didn't have any feedback, but um, announcements we do have. So um, I guess I'll let you handle the first one. Why not? Sure, yeah. The Minecraft server that we run at uh, minecraft.lhspodcast.info has been updated to uh, the Minecraft, uh, the Minecraft, uh, the Minecraft, yeah, the mine, Minecraft, I just said that right, Minecraft version uh, 1.20 point two so one twenty point two so ensure that you've updated your client as well if you're using prism launcher like we're using prism launcher here uh the version eight has been released so uh you know ensure you're you're updating your uh your client runner as well because you may have some problems actually installing the latest version using an older version of uh, prism launcher um also, also multi mc anything like that it works fine as well but but yeah, the game version is running on 120.2. Uh, we don't notice any any oddities with it beyond our normal server herky jerkiness. That <laughs> at least have more resources at it, so I believe we may be out of that. So oh, okay, cool. I can't wait. <laughs> we're, uh, we're now yeah. running 16 gigs of RAM and 12 cores. So nice. I can't wait to get on there and try because <laughs> <laughs> it's like I hate flying, and all of a sudden it's like it's not rendering anything. <laughs> <laughs> it just like stops. And I like, cr- I like, l- I crash into the blank space. And then it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Here's the ground underneath you. It's like, thanks. Um, I haven't noticed that lately. So I'm hoping we're, we're sort of beyond that. And I will, I will say one little divergent thing about Minecraft. I am so, so waiting for 1.21. We get auto crafters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my daughter's waiting for the armadillo, so you know, so she can put some armor on her dogs. There you go. So and yeah, it's looking it's looking pretty good. It's looking pretty good. Like technically, we can enable uh, experimental features <laughs> inside of our server if we wanted to, and uh, we could get some of the stuff now, which would be interesting. But uh, it's better to wait. Better to wait because everything else will start breaking if you, <laughs> if you start turning that stuff on on the server. Oh, and I did. I did make upgrades easier. I did. I did the one thing that I should have done the first time. Um, this is going to be geekery for for those of you who are not so much into Linux and or Minecraft. But the biggest bulk of our Minecraft server is DynMap. the The map of our world is over twenty gigs in size. Oh Jesus! Uh, so what I did was I moved DynMap out of the Minecraft directory and symlinked it. So if I create a new instance, like if there's a one dot twenty dot three or whatever, uh, I don't have to move DynMap. Oh, that's good. So. It makes it much quicker that way. <laughs> and I see Darren is talking about Simple Planes mod again. Can someone please get Darren a set of wings? <laughs> he stops talking about adding planes to our game. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we technically we could add planes, but, uh, you know, a set of wings will solve most yeah. of that. 
Um, and then uh, we'd also talked a little bit about, uh, I mean, speaking about Minecraft, Bill and uh, N3AJ was uh, commenting on, uh, we should probably talk a little bit about, uh, uh, what, what's the other version? Mind test? Is that what it was? Mind, Mind test. test. Yep. Mind test. So, uh, yeah. So expect us to kind of maybe uh, delve into a little bit of experimentation with mind test in the future. Uh, only because, uh, yeah, it looks interesting. I was starting to look at some of the mods and stuff like that, and it would be interesting to try out maybe not just mind test vanilla, but maybe mind test modded and uh, and get a feel for that. So uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Bill, for uh, providing that as a as a as a topic of discussion. Yep, definitely going to try that one out too. Uh, things have obviously been a little busy around here, so I haven't had a super lot of time. I've had plenty of time to be AFK on Minecraft, but not a lot of time to actually play it. So, All right, so next I put in here Linux in the Hamshack merchandise. We don't get a lot of merchandise sales, and that's fine. I'm totally okay with that. However, it is gift-giving season, so if you wanted to get yourself or someone you love a Linux in the Hamshack T-shirt or a mug or something... Uh, you could certainly do that. You can, uh, the links to our two different shops. One's a selfie shop or selfie. I don't think we've ever figured out how to actually pronounce that. And one is a, a shop that I actually host. The one that I host has things like our USB sticks, uh, glassware, custom glassware, stuff like that, where you can, uh, you can get things with your call sign on it and stuff like that. And the other one, the selfie store is where you can get apparel. You can get hats and jackets and t-shirts and things like that and um i will be trying to put up some uh coupons or codes or posting something somewhere uh where you can get discounts on some of this merchandise uh for you know for the upcoming black friday cyber monday the whole thing it's it's coming up real soon now so um be looking for that if you're interested in helping support us by you know buying a jacket or something that'd be great uh bill has bought some of that stuff a lot of the a lot of the apparel uses embroidery, so it's not just uh, uh, the T-shirts, of course, or, you know, silkscreen, but the other stuff actually has embroidered logos and stuff on it. So it's um, not the uh, A-plus super finest uh, quality, but, you know. I they still look good. They still, still look good. Minus B-plus kind of stuff. Yeah, I got the I got the winter caps. I got like two different versions of the winter cap, and I think the, they both look pretty good. Although you complained about one of them, you didn't like the. the I think one was like offset. Yeah, well, I think the logo is slightly offset. So, but uh, I mean, overall the quality looks pretty good, and I'm definitely going to be getting some T-shirts and stuff. So, but uh, yeah, just thought I'd throw that out there, and then uh, just some random thoughts about weekender topics and uh, nets. So we have been receiving some Weekender topics. I think we've got like five or six new ones. So that'll be good. I'll be throwing a few of my own on there. But, of course, it's a big picker wheel, and we have room for lots more topics. And the more topics we have, the longer we can go before we have to bug people about uh, more topics. So uh, if you'd like to send us some, that would be great. And I don't remember if I threw out the idea of doing Linux in the Hamshack-centric nets on the show before. We've, we've but, mentioned it in the past. I don't. I don't think we've ever had any real traction for it. Right. I think I'm going to try it. I think I'm just going to set up a couple. There's two. There's two that I want to do as far as nets. One would be a technical net where we can discuss topics that we would normally discuss on the show, and the other one would be like an AMA net. You know, and ask me anything. Mm. Um, and I would try and set it up in such a way that one of them would be done over, you know, via HF. And the other one would be done so that if you had your droid star or dude star, whatever it is now, <laughs> uh, or any of those other systems, like if you're on all star or echo link or, Oh, yeah. on the M17 reflector, that'd be awesome. Or M17. Yeah. So any of those would be able to connect. So one, one would be an HF net and the other one would be a sort of wide band net via internet technology. So I'll probably set those up, you know, create some preambles and all that stuff, and then we'll announce uh, dates, times, whatnot. And then there was some other discussion about having an LHS OTA event where the hosts and all the people who are listeners of the show would get on the air at some point and try and contact each other and not necessarily have like a scoring system or anything like that, but just have a an on event where you're basically a Linux in the Hamshack listener slash host trying to contact a whole bunch of other Linux in the Hamshacks listeners slash hosts. So mm. um, 
those are some ideas I'm throwing around. So if anybody has any commentary or would like to suggest times or dates or uh, or you know rules or, or anything like that, um, you know we're certainly open for comment. So there's that uh, comment. Oh, Don showed up. It says good evening all. And then Joel, one of our newer listeners, said, "Woohoo! Got rid of Wayland. <laughs> <laughs> um, you won't be able to get rid of Wayland forever, but yeah. I, I definitely uh, commend you for getting rid of it now." Um, and, and considering most of them are running X Wayland anyway, yeah. They're all shimmed. Yeah. So, uh, he also says he'd be willing to try to participate in any of the above uh, online events slash nets, which is great. Good to hear it. Sweet. All right. So with that, let's move on to our subscriber supporters and live participants, the new ones for this time around. And um, Bill, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So we didn't have any new subscribers or Patreons for this particular uh, episode, but that's okay. We have all of you continuing supporters, which is amazing. Uh, Facebook, we had Sean Smith, Joel Brower, and Raymond Penn join us. Uh, which I think is our also new listener here, <laughs> KC0YEW, uh, Joel. Uh, also on, uh, say, Twitter and X, or X, I guess we could just call it X from now on, <sighs> Elon. Uh, nobody joined us there because nobody wants to. <laughs> Thank you, Elon. Uh, YouTube, we have, uh, geez, Swizz Radios, uh, Ray Anderson, Brian Evie, on Discord, we had Ron, Ronnie underscore K4RJJ join us. Uh, W9ZEB Lars join us. Bob KN4B. Uh, Folkert Ham Papa Delta F- 9 Fox Victor Hotel. And let's see, uh, uh, and then there's a CHV7238. Sounds generated. Uh, I'm sure that person will probably rename themselves eventually. And Joel Brower, again, uh, joining us on Discord. Thank you. Uh, Instagram, no, no no joins there. Mastodon, we had at Ground024. Uh, no merchandise sales or mailing list entries for this week. And in the live chat, we have uh, Joel, uh, KC0YEW, Darren, VK6EK, Ted, WA0EIR, Gene, BX8, AAD and Don KB2 YSI. And uh, I would like to have, uh, I, w- I want to mention Ted here, W A 0 E I R. I want him to, I want him to listen intently for the next 10 seconds uh, <laughs> because we have, because um, someone, I can't remember who the call sign and I feel bad about it. Oh no, he's listed right there in X70 um, boosted the server and then I boosted the server as well. So we got Nitro. So now we have some Nitro features. And I think this feature was actually available before that, but it came to my attention because of the boosting. Mm-hmm. And I would like to send this out to, to Ted. Badger. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to actually put all of the stuff that was on the old soundboard into Discord. So they will all be available. And I know he was always looking for that. So I wanted to send uh, one specifically out to him. So <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so so now i can even do this badger 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 yes yes and it, you could have done this with linux show player too so you just totally ruined uh, our whole next show no. <laughs> <laughs> so all right well there we go that takes us down to the end of the show thanks everybody for yeah that's three percent more three percent more <laughs> So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate all our supporters, all our listeners, and uh, everybody who just does anything for the show, including just downloading and and uh, hopefully having a good time with it and maybe learning a little bit along the way. So with that, we're going to go ahead and let you get back with to the rest of your life, and uh, we'll catch you for the next one, which, of course, will be a short topics episode. And by that time, hopefully, Cheryl W5MOO will be back with us. So in the meantime, have a good one. We'll catch you in a week, and we'll wrap this one up. This has been episode number 522 of Linux in the Ham Shack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. And I'm Bill, NE4RD73. Thank you for listening to this episode of Linux in the Ham Shack. LHS is a community-sponsored podcast. Our website is located at lhspodcast.info. You can support the podcast by visiting the LHS Patreon page at patreon.com stroke LHS podcast 
or by using the contribute list on the homepage. We have a presence on Discord, Facebook, IRC, Twitter and YouTube. You can also drop us an email at info at lhspodcast.info or leave us a voicemail at 1-909-LHS-SHOW. That's 1-909-547-7469. Visit the online LHS merchandise store at shop.lhspodcast.info for fun and fashionable show themed merchandise. Until next time, remember to always heed your hedonism. Music